While writing this class, I realized that we would need to give each neuron some position in space. In the human brain, neurons are moving, so we're required to update their position. We learned in the last episode that a single cell is highly complex and holds numerous functions. And the main mechanism by which action potentials travel down the axon is dependent on the ions in the brain. So if we really want to capture the functionality, we would want to program atoms. It will be far too expensive to iterate through all the neurons and update them, let alone every single atom. We could try to multi-thread our code or outsource the computation to a compute cluster, but remember, we're trying to match the functionality of the human brain as closely as possible. In my opinion, it would take more effort to abstract the functionality into OOP concepts than to build a particle simulator with emergent properties. To truly illustrate the need for a new architecture, I wrote two programs that do the same thing. The program on the left is written in Lisp, and the one on the right is written in C. All these programs do is count from 0 to 171 billion. The program prints out the current neuron number and the completion percentage of the program. While I was talking, this program only managed to count a single percent of the total number of cells I plan on iterating over. In reality, the human brain has reaction times around the order of 0.15 seconds. So we would really want our program to run significantly faster than this. Sounds almost impossible given current technologies, right? I think so too. But let's keep going with the idea of a particle simulator and see where it takes us. The human brain has an estimated 1.5 times 10 to the 26 atoms. To illustrate how large that number truly is, recall our experiment from earlier. 171 billion is 0 0.000000000000. 171 billion is this percent of the estimated total count of atoms in the human brain. Imagine how much time it would take to iterate through all those atoms. This particle simulator that we currently plan on making should follow the same basic rules that the atoms in the brain follow. So let's cover a few physics concepts that will help do that. The law of conservation of mass says that mass in an isolated system is neither created nor destroyed by chemical reactions or physical transformations. We can expand upon this definition in quantum mechanics by highlighting instances of no-go theorems. The ones I'm interested in are the no-cloning theorem, the no-hiding theorem, and the no-deleting theorem. According to the no-hiding theorem, if information is missing from one system, which may happen when the system interacts with the environment, then the information is simply residing somewhere else in the universe. Information about an arbitrary quantum state cannot be deleted. It is impossible to create an independent and identical copy of an arbitrary unknown quantum state. Another way to think about an arbitrary quantum state is to call it information. The internet is large-scale evidence of these laws holding true. It shows a vast quantity of information being altered by processes explicitly defined and documented by humans. And although there are many systems in place for caching errors, the internet still works where any undefined behavior is often consequential to something traceable. Let's assume this consistency of systems holds true throughout the universe. Knowing the ridiculous number of particles that need to be simulated, and that information is not lost between interactions of particles, let's hypothesize about the case where we tried to simulate infinite particles, instead of some discrete amount. We do this because the finite case alone takes excessive amounts of compute time, so perhaps some optimizations can be discovered when we consider the infinite case. Existing technologies are not capable of iterating over infinite anything in finite time. We can't have a master list of particles, because we don't have infinite space. We also can't define an origin, because if we do, we won't be able to define a single particle relative to that location, because that particle could be astronomically far away. And we don't have infinite space to represent that as a vector. In this hypothetical, we cannot use a vector to define position, and so we cannot use linear algebra to perform transformations on positions. I also do not want to use set theory because the well-ordering theorem contradicts the need to have no origin. The well-ordering theorem states that every set is well-ordered, even uncountably infinite sets, like the interval from 0 to 1, where we don't even know necessarily where to start. This is a big deal. It means that any collection of things in our minds that we can come up with, as long as they're proven to exist by the earlier, more basic axioms of set theory, can be ordered in some way that has a recognizable starting point, or least element. 
and set theory does not have a good spatial representation of higher dimensional data, because it relies on symbolic set notation. George Cantor considered the well-ordering theorem to be a fundamental principle of thought. In the perspective of set theory, this makes sense, but I will later show that this fundamental principle can be a limitation once you take an infinite step towards the most removed perspective.